The purpose of today's video is to prove this beautiful equation known as Euler's formula. It relates this complex exponential term e to the i phi to the trigonometric functions cosine and sine of phi. And phi here is just some real number. I'm going to prove this equation and we're also going to study exactly what this thing does as an operator. And for all of that, the first thing we need is the complex plane. So let me just draw a vector representing some complex number z here. So if I take this vector and I subject it to an infinitesimal rotation d phi, then I get this new vector that is the original vector plus some vector perpendicular to it. Now, what exactly is a vector perpendicular to z? Well, we saw in the last video that if we take any complex number z and we multiply it by i, then we get a vector perpendicular to z. So that's one piece of the puzzle. Another piece is the vector that we need to fit inside this box has a magnitude of z modulus times d phi. We know that from basic arc length formulae. So piecing together the puzzle means that the vector required here would be i z times d phi. So that is the difference vector or the incremental vector that's perpendicular to z arising as a result of the rotation, the infinitesimal rotation. So the incremental vector dz equals i z times d phi, which implies that we have this interesting looking differential equation that is dz by d phi equal to i times z. And we can solve this equation quite easily. I mean, it's a no brainer that z should be some constant a times e to the i phi. This is the function that satisfies the given differential equation. Okay, now what exactly would the value of a be over here? Well, to determine a, first take notice of the fact that the equation we have expresses z as a function of the variable phi, as a function of the angle phi. So let's write this as z sub phi. z sub phi equals a times e to the i phi. Okay, this is a cool looking equation. And if we return to our diagram, we started off with this complex number here. We started off with this vector that wasn't rotated in any sense, right? We just took this vector as a starting point. So this can be considered as z when phi equaled zero. And we're going to call this z naught. So this implies that z at phi equals zero equals z naught equals a times e to the i times zero. And this is just a times e to the zero and e to the zero is one. So this implies that a equals z naught. Okay, cool. So we conclude that z sub phi equals z naught times e to the i phi. What does this equation mean? Well, it tells us that if we take some vector in the complex plane z naught and apply to it this operator e to the i phi, we get a vector that's actually z naught just rotated by phi radians. So this proves that e to the i phi is a rotation operator. And that's all cool, but are we any closer to proving Euler's beautiful formula? Well, indeed we are. We know exactly what this thing does, so we can just study its effect on a very simple case and try to dissect its action to derive that beautiful equation. Let me show you what I'm talking about. First up, I need the complex plane. And the very simple case I'm talking about is that of some positive real number x. So, oh, terribly sorry about that. Neat shapes off. So let's consider a positive real number x. And by positive real number, I just mean some number lying here on the positive real axis. And the vector representing this real number is 
exactly what I've drawn in orange. And if we subject this vector to a rotation by phi radians, then we get this new vector z in the conflict plane. But wait a minute, we got this vector by taking x and applying to it e to the i phi. So z equals x times e to the i phi. And we know that the length of a vector is invariant under a rotation, so that means the length of z is still x. In other words, what we have here is a vector x times e to the i phi and the horizontal component of this vector using basic trigonometry would be x times the cosine of phi, right? Plus i times, oh, terribly sorry about that once again, the vertical component would be x times the sine of phi. And because x is just some positive real number, we can conclude that e to the i phi in fact equals the cosine of phi plus i times the sine of phi, which is just beautiful, isn't it? This is amazing. It's a wonderful connection between the exponential function and the trigonometric functions in the complex realm. And what if I consider the case for e to the negative i phi? Well, this, of course, would be e to the i times negative phi, correct? Let me just write that out properly. i times negative phi. So that should be the cosine of negative phi plus i times the sine of negative phi. Now cosine being an even function just spits out the cosine of phi, whereas the sine is an odd function. It takes the negative sign outside. So i times the sine of phi, that is e to the negative i phi. And this can be considered as a rotation in the clockwise sense. So if phi is a positive real number, we have a rotation anti-clockwise about the origin. And if phi is a negative real number, then we have a rotation clockwise about the origin. And because these two structures are complex conjugates, we conclude that e to the i phi bar is just e to the negative i phi. So the bar operator just operates on the exponential term, which is pretty cool. Anyway, that's a wrap for today's video. In the next video, we're going to be talking about the polar representation of complex numbers. Till then, I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.